All right, hey guys, welcome to our study where we are breaking down tulip. This is the Calvinist, uh, the Calvinist doctrine, uh, their teaching of salvation. And I am breaking down this acronym too. If I'll get back to this in a moment, but we are breaking down tulip. What did it mean? Um, it, as I said, it is the Calvinist doctrine or teaching of how or what salvation is. And, and, and the reason why I am breaking this teaching down because one, it is quite popular. Um, it is quite popular um, and a lot of who's who believe um, this this teaching or this doctrine and and it, it, it so it fascinated me a number of years ago and I told this before but a number of years ago I was uh, at a particular church which and this is not the Calvinist church but it attracted a lot of Calvinists which is in and of itself kind of interesting or amazing but it, it attracted a lot of Calvinists um, and so we did a discussion with some of the young men at the time that were there, and they they <coughs> the, the subject of Calvinism came up, and the the subject of the Potter's Freedom came up. Now the Potter's Freedom is the book that we are using to um, a kind of really as a reference, and I okay I, I and. This book is written by James Wright. He's the one of the, I'm gonna say, master apologist for. And as you can see, even in in the cover of the book, this is the cover of the book, The Potter's Freedom. And it is, as you can see there, it says a defense of the Reformation, and a rebuttal of Norman Geisler's Chosen but Free. Now. <clears throat> That's what this book is about. My interest, of course, is the Calvinism side of it, or Reformation. The, the the book he is referring to, which we are not getting into, that is the cover, uh, one of the covers anyway, uh, Norman Geisler, um, Chosen But Free. And then, of course, it's the balanced view of God's sovereignty and free will. Now, I didn't study this book. I didn't study this book. Uh, and and um, and let me also say this: a lot of people may even classify me as an Armenian, or even think that I am, um, let's say, maybe defending Armenianism. And I I don't I don't I I know the term. Um, I know the term Armenianism because you know in my studies here. But I've never studied any what you may call Armenians. And when you get into these discussions, this is what they corral you in. Which is why, again, I'm I'm doing this study because it, it, it fascinates me how very learned men, very learned men that are Calvinists. I, I said this before that they're a good friend of, uh there was a, a neighbor of mine who was a pastor of a fairly nice sized church and we was we used to discuss this and he 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 told me he said you know most baptists are calvinists or calvinism or one of the other kind of terms reform theology okay um <clears throat> or um if it's not reform theology it is um, predestination but predestination is more of the uninformed okay uh, it, 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 it does fits it because the idea that God predestined and I'll get to that more later but God predestined those to heaven and God predestined those to hell so the idea there is um, it people would say that it is um, it is a um, like me, 
I I would have said, okay, um, predestination until I came across, um, until I came across this book um, by James White. Now I, I'm familiar with James White as an apologist, and I'm familiar with him, some of his other works, which is what surprised me even more because um, of um, you know I again my thought is how can someone be a Calvinist um, and, uh, and and again that that is my thought how can someone be a Calvinist so um, I'm gonna break it down <coughs> I'm gonna break down the Ackerman tulip okay and one a couple of things before we move on uh, and I said I'm, I'm familiar with James White and some of the other work and, and, and I think he's a great apologist um, but as I begin to read this book and I begin to notice a pattern and one of in, in what I'm talking about now what I'm dealing with now is um, um, hmm, this did not show up here. It's not what I want here. All right. Um, um, hmm. Uh, what happened here? All right. Anyway, um, one of the things that I um, wanted to deal with when we talk about tulip. Um, or even breaking down this um, defense, as you call it there, as he called it, I begin to notice a pattern of how they interpret Scripture. Okay? How they interpret Scripture. Now, so I, I'm taking, before we actually break down Tulip, um, before we actually break down Tulip, and this is the acronym, and I'll get. I'm gonna. I'm gonna highlight this in a moment. Um, um, but I, 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 I begin to see a pattern of how they interpret scripture, and, and so this is very important to understand uh, their method, their method of interpretation. Okay. And um, you, th and, and unless you understand that, you cannot understand why, even this, why are there so many uh, denominations today? Within the Christian, we all say that we're Christians. Why are there so many denominations? And here's why. Um, you have this group, and the group will break off and form their own group, their own belief. Okay. Um. So, when you think about Catholic, why do Catholics believe what they believe? Right. Why do Protestants believe what they believe? Why do Southern Baptists believe what they believe? How about this? Charismatics believe what they believe. Uh, of course, we're dealing with. Uh, reform people how about people that believe you have certain belief, people that believe that uh, like Church of Christ that believe that unless you are baptized in water you're never gonna you're not gonna go to heaven <coughs> then you got um, Pentecostal slash holiness people that believe holiness or hell women can't wear pants jewelry makeup and if you don't live uh, live out the holiness doctrine the way they think holiness is you're not saved and then um, um, of course Catholicism the Pope Mary right and what you find is this you could trace all of their beliefs and interpretation uh, back to usually men, a man or a group of men. In other words, this group of men says this is what this is what the verses say. This is what the Bible says. 
And this is why you have so many different denominations. This is also why you cannot have, in, in, in general, you really cannot have intelligent conversation. Um, 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 conversations without usually emotions riding high because understand this if you challenge someone's thought if you challenge someone's thought their positions and they cannot explain it okay in their mind they have to say well why do I believe this and usually what you find um, um, <coughs> excuse me so so I, again here's the thing if, if I say I believe something and we're going to explore the, the, the method here reform theology again usually the educated theologians, seminary students, okay? If you go to the other extreme, Pentecostal, Pentecostal holiness, not so much as, not not so educated, okay? But nevertheless, the same methodology is the same. I believe the scriptures, and especially in certain areas, right, whatever that theology is, this, that this is what scripture says. This is what I believe about scripture okay and you cannot you cannot um, usually change people mind because this is what they start with this is how they start this is this is this is what they believe okay but I want to again my approach is to say well let's break down the methodology and then, of course, in this particular case, you got to say, okay, if I believe, let's say I believe that water baptism, right? And there are, are a group of people that believe that unless you are baptized, they believe that H2O, physical, the physical properties of H2O, the chemical properties of H2O. is essential to cause a spiritual birth and that's interesting because if that is true that a spirit that that a is a physical property called the physical birth then you the very first thing that comes to my mind what about the thief on the cross and believe it or not you have those apologists that come up um, 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 you have those apologists that will tell you well he, he, he might have been baptized by John the Baptist well there's no scripture that says that there's absolutely nothing to back it up but you see they have to back up something because if you say you have to pass through the chemical properties, the physical chemical properties of H2O in order to have a spiritual... Now, these are my words of saying this. They don't say that. But they do say you have to be baptized as, you know, according to Acts 2.38, you have to be baptized in water in order to be saved. And if you're not baptized you're in water, you're not saved. I mean, and we can go on and on that if God is really... If, if God is really thinking about that if that was really on his mind, that water, so why didn't Abraham get baptized in water? There was water around, right? He, the flood was in their day, just a hundred years in the past, right? But yet, they believe you have to be baptized in water. Um, but my point that I'm bring, the reason why I'm bringing this out is because there is a plethora of scriptures that say make you go well then why didn't God just say that in the first place <clears throat> right why would he spend his time saying everything else except right in other words if, you're gonna, if you say that he that believeth on Jesus he that believeth on the son he that believeth on him hath eternal life 
you got plethora of scriptures that never mentions water baptism, but to them, you have that the way they see scripture. Now the same thing when we talk about this verse of the these verses of scriptures here, when we talk about tulip, let's do a quick um, let's do a quick uh, breakdown of tulip before we move on, so we can be on the same page. Uh, okay, so these are the five points of Calvinism. All right, these are the five points of Calvinism. The first one is total depravity. It says the search that the consequences of the fall of man into sin. Now, I'm going to come back to this statement when we actually get into TULIP itself. <coughs> uh, right now, what I'm really kind of talking about and dealing with is, again, the method of how they interpret. Because that this is important. But, but, but... And then we'll come back to this. We're going to come back to this and look and say, hey, look, this is what? unbelievable. All right. So he says, it search that the consequences of the fall of man into sin. Every person is a slave, enslaved to sin. People are not by nature inclined to love God, but rather serve their own interests and reject the rule of God. Now, that that's true. We, we, we agree with that, but you have, to, you have to go deeper. What they mean is that you cannot even will to do good so therefore you cannot believe despite scripture telling us to believe right all right two un unconditional election so two and three unconditional election and limited atonement to me are the most troubling but all of them play in the part but but understand unconditional election said asserts and I want you to notice the term asserts not the Bible says, but asserts that is breaking down, right? The method. So does God say this? But notice it says unconditional election. And by, in the word, okay, election means choice, right? Election choice. And then he says unconditional election asserts that God has chosen from eternity those whom he will bring to himself not based on any foreseen virtue, merit now get this, or faith in those people notice that, or faith we, again, so we got despite that the Bible tells us over and over again about faith, notice he says unconditional election says, no, 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 no God chooses, right then he says, <clears throat> faith in those he says, rather he says, rather, his choice is unconditionally grounded in his mercy alone. God has chosen from eternity to extend mercy to those he has chosen and to withhold mercy from those not chosen. All right. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> Simply is this. If you are chosen... Hooray for you. If you are not chosen, you're up the creek with no oars. Again, we're going to break this down further, though. In other words, what, they, what, they're, what they're saying here is that God chooses those he wants to save. And then notice the term withhold mercy, meaning then the rest... He haven't chose. Okay? He haven't chosen. So God chooses some to be saved. And then it says the rest he chooses for hell. He chooses not to save them. Right? So this is God's choice. So my, my one of my questions is always this. How do you know if you're chosen? We'll come back to that. But how do you know if you're chosen? Because here's my thing. How do I know if I'm chosen? How do you know if you're chosen? And I want to say this. If I'm not chosen, right? So let's just assume that because he, he puts this in here. As I said before, if you're chosen, hip, hip, hooray, good for you. 
But if you're not chosen, should not know that as well. If I'm not chosen, and no, and by the way, this is just kind of a general statement. It gets deeper. You have to understand that what they mean by this. There is no mercy for you if you're not chosen. There is no appeal to God's mercy. In other words, you're just not chosen. Now remember, I'm gonna I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but remember in, when it says total depravity asserts the consequences of the fall of man into sin. We're gonna put these two together here. Why am I not chosen? Well, according to this, because God chose not to have mercy on me. If I'm if I'm not chosen, right? If I'm not chosen, if well, think about it this way, if I'm not chosen, I should just shut down this whole broadcast, right? I should close my Bible. <clears throat> I certainly shouldn't go to church if I'm not chosen, right? What's the sense of doing good if I'm not chosen? There's no mercy. I'm doomed to hell. All right. First thing, I mean, limited atonement. Assert that. Notice they occur for to say assert. We don't pay attention to that. But if this is something that is concrete, then you, we should say, uh, God says it so. God commands it. God proclaims it. He says it so. But notice, asserts that Jesus' substitutionary atonement was definite and certain in its purpose and what it accomplished. This implies, notice the term, implies that only the sins of the elect <coughs> me, were atoned for by Jesus' death. Okay. I think that is well I think it's despicable because it totally misrepresents God's character now understand this when I say this if I'm not chosen it doesn't matter anyway I can curse God whatever it doesn't matter what, what I'm saying is that To make this statement misrepresent what God has revealed in the Word. And by the way, they are aware of that. That's why when we get back to, uh, we're going to break down, again, their method. Right? Because you have to say, they have some explaining to do. In other words, God says, well, since I only chose whom I chose, whom I chose to have mercy on, why waste the atonement blood on those whom I have not chosen? This is why I say again, how do you know if you're chosen? And furthermore, <coughs> if I'm not chosen, excuse me, if I'm not chosen, right, I have no appeal, I have no hope. This is what they're saying. Then how come God isn't saying this? Think about that. How come God isn't saying this? Um, right? How come God isn't saying this? <laughs> Take these things off here. All right. So, um, let's go on. Limited atonement. Jesus only died for... He only died for whom he chose for. So verse 4 and verse 5, it's kind of, I, I want to say, superfluous in my opinion. However, it says irresistible grace asserts that the saving grace of God is effect, effectually applied to those whom he has determined to save. That is the elect, and again, if you, if it's great news for you, not great news for most. But how do you know? He says, 
Now watch this. So it asserts that the saving grace of God is effectually, is effectually applied to those whom he has determined to save. That is, he select and overcomes their resistance to obeying the call of God, of the gospel, bringing them into saving faith. And my point is, well, what the heck for? If he's already chosen them, if he's already saved them. In other words, why does he need... Why do they need to have faith if he's already chosen them, right? Um, okay, but then it says, <coughs> excuse me, um, um, this means that when God sovereignly purposed to save someone, that individual certainly will be saved. Uh, this is something they feel the need to say, right? To kind of defend the sovereignty of God. This is what they feel, right? And my point is, why? For example, if I'm not chosen, what difference does it make what you say to me? Do, do I care about God's choice? Because I'm lost in sin. And this is what I'm saying. I'm lost in sin. So do I care about what God thinks? Do I care about what anyone thinks? I'm lost. Okay? Five. Um perseverance of the saints then it says asserts that since God is sovereign and his will cannot be frustrated by humans or anything those whom God has called into communion with himself will continue in faith until the end I, I think this is one of the most silly statements because if he's already chose you as they say wh what's the faith part and again we're, we're, we will get into this we would get into this. We're going to break this down. Um, and um, we're going to break this down further. Um, but I, you know, now as I said, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'm going to be um, referring to uh, the, the Potter's Freedom uh, as a reference point because what I find is that it is most um, where is my thing here anyway it is most it it, it, it is um, come it is a, a good representation of all of the apologetic or defense of Reformation or Calvinism okay in other words what, what he's saying here now the only difference here is because there's a couple of things I want you to see how a master apologist such as James White will say things that is unbelievable but they all believe this okay they, they all believe this you, you will find sometimes in the defense of the apologetics realm I, I've been seeing YouTube videos pop up about slavery and Christians how Christians defend slavery and 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 understand understand when I see this there's a pattern so for example um, you, you cannot defend slavery in the Bible you, you cannot defend God's choice of slavery in the Bible so in reality you should just shut up I, I don't I just when people ask, well, why did God do it? Why did God order the annihilation, right, of women and children? I can't answer that. God doesn't defend himself to me. Um, so, um, but James, again, the, the same breakdown that I did. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm going to read James this just quickly. Uh, total depravity. Uh, man is dead in sins completely and radically impacted by the fall. Remember we said that. The enemy of God incapable of saving himself. We agree to this. This does not mean that man is as evil as he could be. Nor does it mean that the image of God is destroyed. Or that the will 
is done away with. Instead, it refers to all pervasiveness of all effects of sin, and that fact, and and the fact that man is outside of Christ, the enemy of God. So again, pretty much as I said, you you see some of the same things here. Now, what I want to get into now is I want to go back and define, okay, and again, because the purpose of this, what I'm talking about here, is the method. I'm, I'm going to, you know, at a later time, we're going to break down TULIP itself. So all of that total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, we're going to break that down and show you, in my opinion, how despicable it is. Because when, when they say, for God so loved the world, you know, you have to figure what they mean is God only loves his elect. So, by process of elimination, then you also have to say that God doesn't love those whom he has not chose. And it is quite the pickle that they're in because how do you say that? Now, again, you have to go back and go, well, why did he say, for God so loved the world? And yes, the method that they employ, okay, the method that they employ um to try to get around that i i like to call it a bill clinton defense if you say that jesus then atonement limited atonement only died for those whom he's called and i said if you're not called then nothing that jesus did matters to you <clears throat> nothing Jesus did applies to you if you're not called. Now, I often say, what is? how do you know you're called if you're a Calvinist? How do you know you're called? And, uh, and what I'm showing you is that when you apply to me, when you get into these, these I'm going to call them damnable doctrines, because this is a gross misrepresentation of God's character and what he said. For God so loved the world in this way. He gave his son. Well, they come along and say, well, hold up, buddy. Hold up on the world part. We're going to get to that, but hold up on the world part. Because we don't really mean world. Do you remember, you know, living in the atonement doesn't mean world. Unconditional condition only means whom God chose us to have mercy on. And the rest of you, you're screwed. So God doesn't mean world. Doesn't mean that. No, 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 no. This is what they're saying. And they try to be slick. But how else can you say that? If limited atonement, as we read, if limited atonement only applies to those whom God chose, and God only has God has only chosen a specific people and did not choose the rest. Right, so there are some in this world from the beginning of from Adam to the end. God has chosen some, but He has not chosen the rest. So, how do you know that you're chosen? Well, let's just say you're not chosen, because there's a good chance you're not chosen. And like I gotta say, if I'm not chosen, let me lights out, right? Lights out. Um, 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 I might as well eat, drink, and be merry. Why try to be good? Right? Why not just give in to my carnal nature? Because right now, in this time, space-time continuum, in this time, it's the best I will ever have. Because I have no hope. And isn't it a false hope to preach the gospel then? To a general crowd. But yet you don't mean that. God doesn't mean that. Go out and preach to the world. Not the world again. Right? That's that thing. Matthew. Go, go into all the world and preach. But just don't preach to everybody in the world. Okay? Um, now, I want to break, kind of break down. And this is. The thing about it is that. 
the purpose of this is to show you the method by which he interprets all right so let me go back because I want to bring it up and then I'm gonna break it down again uh, uh, let's see here. let's go to the scriptures oh huh. well switch over for me here uh-huh oh no got the wrong one sorry all right here we go <coughs> let me bring up Matthew now in this and and this is what he calls and now I'm reading from the book this is chapter 6 uh, chosen but free CBF big three verses so what he has been doing throughout has been um, um, again so he's he's refuting the verses that Norman Geisler uses so let's read it and then we will come back to it Matthew 20, uh, 23 and in verse 37 he says Jerusalem Jerusalem she who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings yet you were not willing see your house is left to you desolate for I tell you you will never see me again until you say woe he who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed one so here's his response to this he says this passage uh, these passages are often used now let me go back to uh, um, I read this already. I just want to center in on. So, see, uh, chosen but free. He uses, I'm reading now, hit under the Matthew 23, 37 here. CBF, or chosen but free, offers no in-depth exodus of the passage. Now, let me stop and talk about exodus, okay? Um, the And, 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 I, and I, let me just say this from the start because... Um, I'm not a I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not a scholar, uh, and as I said before, when in, in our in our first study with this, who am I that I can challenge such scholarly work? And as I said, my reply was I can read, so I can read the Bible. And we're going to get in. I'll get into later uh, about the Greek. Oh, um, you know what? I kind of get into it now. I'll get into it now. Because I'm on it. Um, but, um, so oftentimes people, like when he uses this word exit, is that, the term exit simply means to dissect the verse, explain the verse, really go into its meaning. The problem with the term is exactly what he is attempting to do here dissect the verse let's kind of go back and so what you know you want to kind of go back and say all right so he and when he says exodus the word exodus okay and i'm being funny here but it, it simply means to um break a verse down okay now the, the problem with that is if you if you do that if you dissect a verse in other words so you take it out of its of its context and then you only dissect the verse okay if that's what if, if, if that's what you do then understand that you can uh, make the verse say whatever you want to say okay you could you could make it say whatever you want to say and that's a lot of times what people do now another thing that people oftentimes um, let me read you a, a proper thing of Exodus it says is a critical explanation or interpretation of a text um, and and so that's one of the problems with that to me that you when you do that you am I really getting the meaning here 
So let's see his exodus of the verse. Okay. Um, he says, he says, CB is offered no in depth exodus of the passage. Instead, we are given a uh, two sentence that some summarizes uh, Geisler's interpretation of it. I'm not going to get into Geisler's interpretation again. Um, so, uh, let me go back. Okay. So, then he says this verse is then used in conjunction with 1 Timothy 2.4. And we get to that. And boy, will we get to that one. So, notice this step right here now. So, when I come down to... Uh, he said, the first uh, fact to uh, ascertain in examining any given scripture is its context. Now, what does he mean by that, right? The passage comes in the midst of a proclamation of judgment upon the leaders of the Jews. Matthew 23 contains the strongest denunciation of the scribes and the Pharisees in all of the gospel. True. Who then is Jerusalem? And this is where the problem comes in at. Who then is Jerusalem? It is assumed by Arminians, again, I'm, I'm not here to talk about Arminians, that, but it's assumed by a lot of people just read the plain reading of the text, but watch this. It is assumed by Arminian writers that Jerusalem represents individual Jews who are therefore capable of resisting the work <laughs> and the will of Christ uh, but upon what warrant do we leap from Jerusalem to individual Jews the context would not lead us to conclude that this is to be taken in a universal sense Jesus condemning the Jewish leaders and in it and it is to them that he refers this is clearly seen in that one it is the leaders that God sent prophets to it is the Jewish leaders who killed the prophets and those who sent to them three Jesus speaks of your children differentiating those to whom he is speaking from those that the Lord desires to gather. Okay? So, the context referred to Jewish leaders, scribes, and the Pharisees. Half true. In other words, it's true. Jesus, in Matthew 23 here, okay, um, talks about how Jerusalem, but he's also talking about the leaders throughout time, have rejected God but he misses something here so then he says Jerusalem Jerusalem okay so if what he is saying here is that Jesus is only talking about Jerusalem or the leaders of Jerusalem right and he is but is that the extent to that so then let's answer the question to whom then is the condemnation so look at it, verse 37 again. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So when he speaks, so he didn't say leaders of Jerusalem because he does speak of leaders of Jerusalem. In fact, let's um let's do this. Let's I'm gonna do just a quick uh where yet uh Jeremiah. Okay, this is Jeremiah um 13. All right. Now Jeremiah has been throughout his book, and 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 some people refer to him as a weeping prophet, but not necessarily knowing why. But he's a weeping prophet because he uh, he he has the unfortunate prophetic ministry doing the destruction of uh, Israel. Okay. Um understand <clears throat> the writings of the prophet now I agree with him when he said you have to understand the context the writings of the prophet so you go back to Isaiah Isaiah is about 80 years before 
don't hold me exactly to that timeline, but about 80 years, okay? So I, Isaiah comes along during the time of King Hezekiah and other kings. He begins to what? Warn the people. Well, how do you warn the people? You speak through the prophets to the leadership. The leadership guides the king or the kingdom and his people. Let me just show you something real quick here. Um, um, so <coughs> in this verse, he, notice he is <clears throat> um, let, me, let me start right here. And, and this is the kind of messages throughout. It says, um, what will you say when he appoints close friends as leaders over you, ones who yourself were trained? Now, I just wanted to show you one of the things that he is referring to. Uh, but let's see here. Oh, where are you at? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh. All right, I'm just gonna look at verse. Look at verse 27. He says, um, "Your adulteries and your lustful name, your heinous prostitution." Now, who is he referring to here? He says, "On the hills, in the fields, I have seen your detestable acts. Woe to you, Jerusalem! You are unclean." For how long yet? Now I want to go back to uh, Matthew. Now the reason why I pointed this out is to show you a pattern of language, a pattern of um, of how Scripture is used, and and part of the problem of what's called exegesis or exegesis, exegesis, right? This explaining, right? So you come down, look at verse uh, 27. Woe well, to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like washed by tombs. Now, so this is true in that um, you see over and over again, Jesus expressly um, denouncing the Pharisees. But when he gets down to verse 37, he then shifts and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, she who kills her prophet and stone those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children, who, Jerusalem, as hen gathers her chicks under her wings, yet you were not willing. Now he will say, well, the Pharisees were not willing. Really? Were the Pharisees not willing? Is he referring to the Pharisees here? He said, see, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will never see me again until you, you say, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. All right, so let's talk about this now. If he is referring to only the Pharisees here, as he tries to say here, because the reason what, throw, what, what they don't like with this is when he says, how often I wanted to gather your children as hen." Under a chick. Now he would say this refers to the only, only the leaders, only the Jewish leaders here. Okay. All right. If that's true, then, and you got to go back during the times when you saw the same language that Jeremiah used, you can see the same language that Isaiah used, and when they begin to pronounce judgment over the nation. So who are they referring to? So when he says here, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, is it just the demise of the Pharisees? In other words, okay, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And notice the shift right here. He stops here all the way back up to verse 1. He starts saying the scribes and the Pharisees. Did he just say Jerusalem? Notice, sit in the chair of Moses, right? He comes down. They, who? Scribes and Pharisees. They, verse 5, 
do everything scribes and Pharisees. They, right, scribes and Pharisees. Um, uh, let's go down. But woe, verse 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, verse 14, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And then he says, woe to you, blind guides, right? Um, blind fools, verse 17. Uh, verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 24, blind guides. Verse 25, woe to you, um, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 27, right? Verse 29, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Um, verse 33, snakes, brood of vipers. Who? Scribes and Pharisees. Now look at verse 34. He says, this is why I'm sending you prophets, sages, and scribes, and some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will flog in your synagogues <clears throat> and hound from town to town so that all the righteous blood shed on earth will be charged to you. Now, is it only the scribes and the Pharisees? From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of uh, Zechariah, the son of Barachai, which you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. I show you all these things will come on this generation. Now, after denouncing them, he then says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How are we to make the connection only that he's referring to the scribes and Pharisees when all along he's been uh, talking to, about the, um, the, the Pharisees. He's been talking about um, scribes and Pharisees. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So there's no reason right now when he changes Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Okay, where, why, why do I think he's not referring to Jerusalem, Jerusalem? And then she says, "She who kills the prophets, who Jerusalem? Why? They have had a history of doing that." And then he says, "How I often wanted to gather your children." So is he saying? So even if he's saying this here. Um, so let me go back. I'm going to read something here. Uh, he says, The vital important thing uh, to make here is that the ones the Lord desired to gather are not the ones uh, who were not willing. Why not? Okay, now watch this. Jesus speaks to the leaders about their children, and that the leaders would not allow him to gather allow him to gather so now let's stop remember that one of the things he says that he teaches that Calvinist teaches is that you can't stop whom God chooses he's just saying here that Jesus speaks to the leaders about their children that they the leaders would not allow him to gather well if he wanted to gather them, how could he stop them Jesus was not seeking to gather the leaders but their children he says this uh, uh, this one consideration alone when it's a passage it's useless for the Arminians seeking to establish his free will of them <clears throat> the children of the leaders would be Jews who were hindered by the Jewish leaders from hearing Christ. Well, what difference does it make according to them? They can't stop it anyway. They can't stop the sovereign move of God. The you were not then referring to the same men indicating by the context the Jewish leaders who were unwilling to allow those under their authority to hear the proclamation of Christ this verse then is speaking 
to the same issues raised earlier in Matthew 2013. But what are you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Now, this is, to me, does it make sense if, by, according to Calvinism, if, according to them, um, you can't stop God's will, you can't stop God's sovereignty, and then if this verse then is talking only about then, as he comes to verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, now he switches and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, what we really mean is the leaders of Jerusalem, so she who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. Well, did the people stone? And by the way, does this condemnation not extend to the people? Does this condemnation does not say, for example, in AD 70, who are the ones that were killed? Was it only the status, I mean, the Pharisee that describes? Was it not the entire nation destroyed? Was it not the temple destroyed? Was it not people who, as as we get into the next chapter, 24, Jesus also predict because of their rejection of Christ, okay, because how they reject Jesus, see, your house is left to you desolate. What house is he referring to? Is he only talking about the houses of the scribes and Pharisees? Or is he referring to the nation? Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip over there. See if I can find it right quick. Uh, okay. So watch this verse here. Because he... Now, remember he talks about the house. Let's go back to verse 1. As Jesus left. Now remember, this is the continual scene right here. So he leaves the scene. The temple scene. <clears throat> Jesus left going out of the temple complex. His disciples came up and called his attention to the temple buildings. Then he replied to them, Don't you see all these things? I assure you, not one stone would be left here upon another that would not be thrown down. So then he begins to explain this. They ask him a question. He begins to explain this. And uh, do, 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 do. now watch this, verse 9. Then they will hand you over for persecution and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will take offense and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise and deceive many because lawless will multiply and the love of many will grow cold. Notice who are they referring to? Only the Pharisees. Actually, remember, he's already left their presence, he's left their company. And then he says in verse 13, that the one that endures to the end will be delivered. The good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Uh, so, here's, um, ooh. All right, so, again, um, my, this, I want you to see the method here of trying to twist a scripture when he says that um, <clears throat> excuse me when he says that um, 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 you know this verse here doesn't mean what it verse now next week when we get into first Timothy 2 4 whoo watch that one um, because again does all mean all okay now you look at in the Old Testament and some of the language of the Old Testament helps us to interpret the language that Jesus referred to the language that John and even the New Testament writers um, uh, 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 that they referred how they use this in other words, if he wants to do what they call proper exegesis, right, 
then why wouldn't he quote other scriptures to show that? And then as I said, if in that verse, if he's only talking about the leaders, then are not the people, when he says Jerusalem, Jerusalem, are not the people were affected by that? They sure were in 70 AD when the entire nation, the same thing within that Jeremiah, when Jeremiah says, woe to you, Jerusalem, Babylon came, and like in Jeremiah's day, I believe it was just 20 years after, you know, he prophesied that, and destroyed the city, ravaged the city. All right, guys, we're going to pick this up next week, and we're going to, can break, we're breaking down the method before we actually break down, again, some of the tulip itself. We will break down tulip, but again, it's important to understand how they, how they interpret scripture. And unfortunately, even a lot of other churches. Okay, guys, look, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to share, like, and share these videos. Hit that subscribe button. And uh, look, uh, see you next week. All right.